Support for Trail of History provided by Bragg Financial Advisors, providing portfolio management and comprehensive planning advice for high net worth clients and institutions. Committed to our clients and to our community. BraggFinancial.com. This is a production of PBS Charlotte. There's plenty of history in the state of North Carolina, from the birthplace of a future president, to a colonial era fort, to a boarding school for African Americans in the era of segregation, and a mound built by Native Americans thousands of years ago. These sites, along with many others, tell the collective story of the old North State. We'll hit the road to four of North Carolina's 27 state historic sites to share the history behind each and introduce you to the passionate people who bring these sites alive for visitors. All that and more on Trail of History. Look up the word history, and it's defined simply as the study of the past. And to study our past, you have many options. There are books, television shows, the internet, of course, or actually visiting the places where history happened. Here in North Carolina, there are hundreds of places, ranging from historical markers to local museums, each exploring the state's diverse past. And there are 27 official historic sites around the Tar Heel State, each offering a unique link to the past. The sites that we have um, all around the state really help weave that fabric of the North Carolina story. It's hard to put into words how valuable this is uh, to have a treasure like this available to the public and to come out and to learn and not only uh, what's interpreted here, you know, from this great staff, but also just the surroundings and kind of what you feel and how you connect to history in places like this. Whether it's exploring a Native American village or... From mining for gold and getting a good education on the history of the gold here in the Carolinas. The things you can experience around North Carolina vary widely from the region in the state to the time period represented. From mountains to sea, as far east as Manio with the Roanoke Island Festival Park, and as far west as the Thomas Wolfe House, commemorating the life of the famous writer Thomas Wolfe who wrote Look Homeward Angel. We have a site that really focuses on the life of indigenous people who would have been a part of a mound building culture, and we tell that story at Town Creek Indian Mound where we know that people lived um, in, in a flourishing society. We also have sites uh, like the site where we are today, the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum that are from the 20th century. Other 20th century um, sites also include the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Certainly we have tons of battlefields um, and structures at the, like the People's House, the state capitol. Michelle Lanier is the director of the North Carolina Division of State Historic Sites and Properties. Each one of our historic sites, in my mind, um, functions as a treasure. It's really an honor for those of us who are public historians, or as I would like to say, keepers of memory, to be stewards of these stories. We have amazing staff experts who can help people understand extremely complicated histories, ranging from histories of war and human bondage, issues around race and gender and class, cultural expressions and many different kinds of people who all at one time or another called North Carolina home. We can understand by visiting these sites more about what it means to be human, the complexities of the human experience. We can understand more about ourselves. Historic downtown Statesville sits in the heart of Iredell County, but before it was officially a county, it was just part of the old Carolina backcountry. The hilltop that we're standing on is the site of a fort that was constructed 265 years ago during the French and Indian War. Known 
as Fort Dobbs, and only three miles as a crow flies from modern-day Statesville. It was named for the colonial-era governor of the state, Arthur Dobbs. The original fort is long gone, and until just a few years ago, a visit to Fort Dobbs left a lot to the imagination. We had a hole in the ground where the archaeology had once happened, and to try to uh, get visitors to get excited and use their imaginations and understand the importance of the history here when you're just walking around a historic hole in the ground is pretty difficult. But today, standing tall on the original site is a new Fort Dobbs. Site manager Scott Douglas says getting the project going took years of research. In the last decade, as we were uh, gearing up towards rebuilding the fort, we made sure to complete the archaeological surveys of the entire footprint of the building. And years of dreams. I'm still not fully processed the fact that we, we have the fort here now. It was something that our staff, our volunteers, dreamt about, planned for, thought about for so long. And you know, there were times in that process when people maybe thought it wasn't going to be able to be successful. The reconstructed Fort Dobbs opened in 2019. We had 2,000 visitors that first day, and the ability to see all these excited people go into that fort for the very first time, to see it act as a teaching tool that we had planned for it to be for so long has really been an incredibly fulfilling part of my career. Now, visitors who step inside the new Fort Dobbs step back in time. We try to make it an immersive experience. It's a museum exhibit, but one that you can walk through and be part of in a way. We try to avoid having rope lines and do not touch signs. Everything in the fort is a reproduction of original uh, items, weaponry and clothing and stuff like that. And so during our guided tours, we actually encourage visitors to pick up items, to sit on beds, to feel the warmth of a fire in the fireplace, and hopefully it lets Ends a sense of actually stepping back in time and being in a real fort that people really are living in uh, and getting a, a more of an understanding of that, of what it would have been like. And several times a year. We'll have people literally living their lives in that building for a 48 hour period of time. And visitors walking through that can get an even uh, deeper level of understanding of, you know, how smelly was this place with 50 sweaty soldiers in there? That's maybe not the most attractive way. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what was it like for people to cook around each other, to have all these soldiers sitting down to eat a meal? What was it like to be in the building when it filled with gun smoke in battle? Those are all things that living history programs allow us to experience. Now, if you're wondering if Fort Dobbs ever saw action, interpreter Jason Melius has the answer. There was a battle here, and it was not between French allies and the soldiers here. It was actually between former British allies, the Cherokee Nation. And here on uh, February 27, 1760, a party of Cherokee attempted to draw the soldiers out of the fort at about eight or nine o'clock at night and ambush them about 300 yards down, uh, down the hill over there. The original Fort Dobbs was abandoned and eventually lost to time after the end of the French and Indian War. But Melia says the new fort makes his job a joy. I love this job. It's fun. You get to do a lot of research and we use the fort more as a tool to talk about the people that were involved here. So it's not, uh, not necessarily a, um, like an old house tour. We go through the rooms and talk about the lives that were going on inside of the rooms, and then ultimately about the battle, the Cherokee War, and trying to give perspective to both sides. This is a crucial piece of American history that isn't really focused on that much in popular culture. It's something just that happens before the American Revolution. But the French and Indian War is a global conflict. It sets the stage for the Revolutionary War. It creates uh, the path to what is now the United States today. It has a lot of repercussions that we still feel in our modern society. This is the only state historic site in North Carolina where we have the opportunity to tell this story of our state's role in the conflict. So the next time you're near Statesville, consider a visit and immerse yourself in the North Carolina backcountry and journey to the mid 1700s at Fort Dobbs State Historic Site. Each of the
the 27 historic sites in North Carolina offers a unique snapshot of the state's past. Just east of Greensboro, there's a one-of-a-kind site that tells a unique story of a woman on a mission to change the world through education. Dr. Brown, what she did just at the turn of the 20th century, at a time when racial terror was certainly at one of its heights historically, she created an oasis space, a space where if you are in a, a desert-like social climate that is not welcoming to you and your kin, how can you create a place where you can flourish, learn, grow, develop, create, make connections? She contributed to the larger sense of human equality, social justice, as well as a sense of self-determination for African Americans, not just in North Carolina, but really she had an international impact. It's quite a miracle that she was able to do this as a black person, but certainly as a black woman and a black Southern woman in a Southern community during an era of intense and legal segregation. But exactly who was this pioneering woman? Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown was born in Henderson, North Carolina, and with one of the great migration stories north, her family did end up making home um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And one um, moment of inspiration resulted in her coming back south to work um, to educate young people here in what is now Sedalia, North Carolina. This is where Dr. Brown founded a school to educate young African Americans. Here at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum, we are telling several stories. One of the stories that we're telling is of Historic Palmer Memorial Institute, which was a college preparatory boarding school for African Americans. The Palmer Memorial Institute, named after former Wellesley College President Alice Freeman Palmer, opened its doors in 1902. It operated as a boarding school with students and some faculty living on campus. This was a place that was extremely vibrant. We had students from all over the world. According to Lanier, the education received at the Institute was world class, with many of its students going off to do great things. We had students that certainly went on to become educators just like Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Some students went into medicine. Some students went into military careers. Some went into music careers. And some went into politics. But the impact of the institution went well beyond the campus. We can see the influence of Dr. Brown on, you know, black land ownership, entrepreneurship, business ownership, um, a sense of um, leadership and autonomy in determining how one lives a life. And then we see that ripple effect all over the world. Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown led the school for a half a century. During that time, she showed some hardcore determination to build a unique learning environment for students. The legacy that she built is really on par with many small colleges. She was someone who attracted the attention of donors and artists, civic leaders, educators, politicians, Eleanor Roosevelt visited the campus. The poet Langston Hughes spent time here working with students. Josephine Baker came here. And much of that fundraising was done right here in Canary Cottage, Dr. Brown's home. When you walk into the home, you will immediately get a sense of the purpose of the home. It was a place for hosting. It was a place for talking to donors. It was a place where she could have her mother, maybe some students visiting artists and dignitaries stay. And at times, one particularly famous American musician would visit the house. Nat King Cole married into Dr. Brown's family and became, of course, a really beloved part of the family. We have images of Nat King Cole playing the piano that still is right here in Canary Cottage. Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown retired in 1952 and passed away in 1961. She's buried on campus near her beloved Canary Cottage. The school itself, though, closed in 1971. The property then passed through several owners until the 1980s when alumni of the school began a movement. Over time, there was a really powerful 
um, catalyzing of the Palmer alums to say, this should be a museum. This should be a place where people could come and learn about the school, learn about Dr. Brown, learn about African American history in North Carolina. The school may be closed, but Lanier says this campus still has a place in educating those who walk these grounds. We really hope that this will also be a community anchor that connects to all of the needs that we have um, to walk to move, to learn, to bring back some of the life of the school. In 2021, the school received a grant of more than $480,000 from the National Park Service with the goal of doing further restoration on the student center known as the Tea House. The funding comes from a program specifically targeting the preservation of African American history. With the continued investment and the hard work of the staff, the legacy of the Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum will continue enriching the lives of visitors for years to come. Imagine for a moment you're a farmer, and right in the middle of your field is a rather large mountain of dirt. Well, in the early 1900s, this was cotton fields with a mound in the center. There was something special about this mound. It attracted unwanted attention from would-be treasure hunters who would trespass on the land. With the mound in danger, state archaeologists stepped in. They came out, they started the research in 1937. There was an acre of land that was donated to the state of North Carolina, and Dr. Joffrey Coe, the first archaeologist that out here leading the project, he carried on that archaeological work for decades. Today, this site encompasses 50 plus acres. Welcome to the Town Creek Indian Mound State Historic Site. We are outside the town of Mount Gilead, which is in the south central Piedmont of the state. And we're at a very unique historic site because this is the only one that deals exclusively with American Indian history. The main attraction here, the mound itself. It is a very uh, well engineered pile of dirt. This. <laughs> The people here planned it. They, they have it oriented the, the way that they wanted it to be. This well-designed pile of dirt actually isn't that unique. There used to be hundreds of them built across the southeast and in other parts of the country. It's a well-preserved example of Mississippian culture. People have been here for over 12,000 years. Um, for most of that time, people were hunting and gathering. But about a thousand years ago, they started living here permanently and uh, practicing this Mississippian cultural tradition. Allen adds that location was key for the success of this village. This is a rich resource environment. So they're, they're growing corn, there's squash and, and pumpkins and beans. So all of these are being uh, eaten predominantly here in the southeast. There's all sorts of wild fruits that people can gather in. And then the animals that are out here, the deer and the rabbits and the turkeys and, and all sorts of other things that people can hunt. Site manager Rich Thompson says it's hard to estimate how many people actually call to Town Creek home. It's anybody's guess. We're at what would have been the equivalent of a, a county seat or a, a state capital of sorts. This was a, a, a political center. It was a religious center. It was a place where people met for commerce. There were artisans that practiced uh, you know, skills here. Uh, it was a center for trade and it would have been a, a, you know, a large population center. And it was the mound that was at the heart of the village. It's a monument, it's, a, it's an example of prehistoric monumental work and, uh, and it was built to elevate a particular building, what uh, we refer to as the townhouse, but that structure served sort of like your courthouse or legislative building and it was also a little bit like a church as well. Visitors to Town Creek can step inside the reconstructed townhouse and other structures to get a feel for what it might have been like to live here a thousand years ago and how the buildings were constructed. Here with this village site, it was round buildings and these are constructed with wattle and daub architecture. So the wattle is that there's branches that are woven in and out of posts like making a basket and then daub is clay that's packed in on top. As director of the Museum of the Southeast American Indian in Pembroke, Nancy Fields visits Town Creek often. On this day, she brought a group of teachers from all over the state for a first-hand look at the village. So what we're doing is we are fulfilling a really exciting project. I brought a group of social studies teachers out to the site and we are gathering content to create a teaching curriculum, a statewide teaching curriculum. But as a Native American herself, walking into the village is also very personal. I think probably one of my favorite parts even before getting to the stockade is the pathway that leads into that place. It is spiritual and you can't help but feel this very visceral innate connection to this place. It's always peaceful 
and I appreciate the solitude and the quiet to really think about and reflect the people that were here and honor their memory and kind of be still with them. According to Thompson, a visit to Town Creek can change perspectives. A lot of people will come to the site and they know that this site deals with American Indians and, and they come in with this um, idea that you know these were primitive people. Um, they, they lived uh, maybe a backwards life, a, a hard, unnecessarily hard life, but when they see this site and they see uh, the information we have in the, uh, the museum about what Town Creek was like, it, it changes their mind. These folks were sophisticated. Town Creek Indian Mound connects North Carolinians to a way of life 12,000 years in the making and a connection to a much overlooked part of the continent's history. Pineville's Main Street bustles with shops and traffic and the Little Sugar Creek Greenway offers an escape. But there was a time just after the American Revolution when just a few settlers called this area home. One of those families, the Polks. Well, today we're at the President James K. Polk State Historic Site, which is the birthplace of our nation's 11th president, James K. Polk. James K. Polk was born here on the property. He was here the first 11 years of his life before the Polks eventually moved, uh, left Mecklenburg County here in the fall of 1806 to move out to South Central Tennessee. Site manager Scott Warren says this site not only shares Polk's story and presidency, but also interprets life here in Mecklenburg County as the United States found its way as a new nation. You know, the Polks, when they were here, had a, a large working farm, almost 429 acres. The Polks, um, along with the five enslaved people that were here during the time of the Polks, uh, worked the farm here. They grew cotton, corn, and would you know, certainly take that into Charlotte to sell. Outside, preserved on the site, are several cabins from around Mecklenburg County. We've got three historic structures that were moved here in the 1960s when the site was being developed. And we actually think that the larger cabin is really a good example of uh, the type of home that the Polks would have had uh, when they were here. He says staff at the Polk site are also working hard to include the stories of those once enslaved on this very land. Our assistant site manager, Kate Moore, is, has been doing a lot of research on the enslaved that were here at the Polk Farm. We do know that there were five enslaved individuals here. And really what we're striving to do is give them a little more voice, give them a little more prominent presence here at the site. Inside the Visitor Center is where you learn more about the site's namesake, James K. Polk, the 11th President of the United States. When you first come in, you'll get a sense of the history of Mecklenburg County, the environment that the uh, Polks were in, that they farmed in, lived in at that time. It uh, transitions over into the growth of the United States during the 1820s. Our next section gets into the election uh, of 1844 and how Polk was nominated from the floor of the convention. And it finally ends with the, one of the landmark events that happened here in Polk's presidency, the Mexican War. Warren says Polk's presidency is often overshadowed by more well-known presidents of the era, but nonetheless impacted the country's path. Polk is right in between two very strong presidents, Jackson, uh, who was Polk's mentor and the seventh president, and then Lincoln on the other end of the spectrum. When he was in power and, and was uh, in office, he actually accomplished four things that uh, were certainly you know, monumental in United States history. He acquired uh, you know, all the way out to California. He settled the Oregon Territory boundary dispute with Great Britain. He ended up um, lowering the tariffs at that time. And also he ended up really kind of corralling in the uh, federal funds that were scattered throughout the United States in various private institutions and state banks. A visit to the James K. Polk site offers far more than a bit of trivia on a former president. It offers perspective on where we've been as a county, a state, and a nation. You know, all of North Carolina's uh, state-run historical sites uh, tell a different part of our state's history. Uh, they delve into different aspects of the lives of all types of citizens of North Carolina and some of the major stories in, in world history that our state has been part of. Every site is different. Every site has a unique story to tell. Um, they're all valuable in their own place in history.
hoping that people will understand that these spaces have usefulness on multiple levels, intellectually, educationally, recreationally, but also at the end of the day, we want this to be a, a place of connection, a, a commons for us to gather and bear witness to histories that are complex, are intriguing, in some ways could be inspiring, but they make us know who we are. There's also so many different flavors of history. You can get every single era that's been here in, in North Carolina, and everybody has an interest. So um, somewhere in this state, somebody can find a piece of history that they would love to go see in person. With the variety of the sites offered and preserved by these passionate caretakers of history, North Carolina's state historic sites make it possible for you to take a single road trip and to travel on your very own trail of history. of PBS Charlotte.